within the program that you're going to hear about tonight. But uh, we really want to start out having Mark Costello uh, talk to you because the first thing you do um, if you are entering as an accelerated degree program uh, candidate is you would talk to your undergraduate advisor. Um, and Mark is an undergraduate advisor for many of you here. Um, and I'll let him talk to you about what happens from undergraduate to what we call the bridge when you bridge over into the graduate program. Bridge over troubled water. Yes. <laughs> no trouble, no waves. So what I do when a student expresses an interest in the accelerated program is work with my majors, and you said you're marketing, right? So you would go to your advisor over in LeBeau express the interest and then um, that what we do is get you started the, the, the main thing the main first question you want to ask is based on where you are in the program how many credits you've completed your <coughs> GPA and the courses you have left can you fit the coursework into the rest of your plan of study how can it work for you so traditionally the students are in a five-year three co-op plan the graduate program is an additional 45 credits above the 182 in our college. Our marketing might be very similar, in addition to the undergraduate credits as well. So how do we fit in those extra 45 credits and still have to graduate on time? Okay, What you do is forfeit the third co-op, which is an approved policy for these accelerated programs, giving you two extra terms to start fitting in those courses. Okay. So what I have here that you can look at is a, a template, as you can see, mostly blank, but with the graduate courses for the communication masters plotted so you can see how that works okay, and where you would place them. Okay. So that, that might be helpful for you. All right. um, once we talk about it and we decide that the mechanics are going to work, that you can fit in uh, your courses, uh, then I get you in touch with either Dr. Stein or Dr. Reynolds to discuss the specialization areas and which one interests you most, would benefit you most, and then you get into more specific coursework and advising at that level. But basically, that's what I'm here to help uh, do that. The application, where did I put those? You can see, because you're already a Drexel student, you don't have to reapply separately to graduate admissions. I keep looking back here as if there's students back here too. You can apply too. <laughs> so you can see here how simple the application process is. Once we deem it um, doable, you meet the criteria, it's appropriate, and I approve, your undergraduate advisor and marketing approves, Dr. Stein, Dr. Reynolds approves, you're, you're ready to go. Okay, so, good. So as Mark said, um, there are a couple of advantages of going through the accelerated degree program. One of them is, at least the way we're currently set up, is you pay undergraduate uh, tuition all the way through as long as you go through the five-year uh, three co-op plan. And also the application process is a lot easier. So you don't have to, if you're applying to the CCM program, Communication for Media, you don't need to do the, the GREs, you don't have to do the 1,500-word essay. You don't need to get letters of recommendation or find official transcripts and upload them and, and it's a longer process. So with the accelerated degree program, you visit with your advisor, you visit with either um, me or Rachel, and then you submit it to graduate studies and you hear very quickly. So um, Dr. Rachel Reynolds directs the communication culture and media concentration, and I'm gonna have her tell you a little bit about that program. Okay. Up over here, just work, work my way around the room a little more. Um, hi, everybody, thanks for coming. Um, you guys here actually don't know about this new concentration in communication, culture, and media because it's, it just began um, over this past year. We currently have seven students in it, and um, it was created um, as sort of a matchup to the PhD program. It's, a, it's an academically focused degree, and um, we in particular want to teach students about how social relations are created through media um, and what, what effects media have on social relations. Um, you'll do a lot of advanced learning with faculty, so if you really enjoyed a class with Lawrence Sauter or um, Ernie Hockenden or Devin Powers, you may get the chance then to take their advanced graduate level courses, uh, to give you another example. 
And then you can also take the highly specialized methods classes and do original research as you're completing that degree if you want to take, try your hand at that. It's a, it's a good program in particular um, for if you, if you want to test the waters to do a PhD in an um, academic subject. Um, and uh, I want you to also know that next year we're going to make the requirements a little more flexible than they currently are um, because we're, we're altering some of our scheduling. So if you want specifics on that, what that's going to be, let me know. And so finally, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what we call the applied concentrations. So these are for students who are interested in working in more applied fields and aren't as interested in academic, um, having an academic focus to the program. So right now we have three concentrations. One is public communication, one is science communication, and one is technical communication. Uh, right now, we're in the process of making um, a series of revisions to all three of them. Uh, most likely what's going to happen is we're going to, um, we're hoping to combine the science and technical and create a science, technical, and health um, focus to have a, kind of a, a broader category under which you can specialize in whatever areas are most relevant to you. Um, both um, Dr. Souter, uh, actually, several several people in here teach uh, courses in those applied tracks. Um, our public communication program is really designed to focus on students who are interested in um, fields that touch on public relations, journalism, international communication. Hi. Hi. Sorry. That's okay. Come on in and have a seat. Um, and science and technical. Um, and, and hopefully as we adjust to include more health communication, uh, provide routes to help you launch careers in a variety of fields from pharmaceutical, writing for pharmaceutical industry, as um, Julianne will talk to you about uh, a little bit later, also more advanced careers in public relations, um, and obviously you're gonna be hearing from our panelists today about some of the, the different kinds of careers that you could land in. So um, I'm available to talk after the panel if you have any specific questions. Um, but one of the things I did want to mention is that as far as our curriculum goes and the program goes, um, regardless of which of the three applied tracks you end up in, um, there are two uh, core required courses that everybody needs to take. One of them is a research-focused course. One of them is a theory-focused course. And then each concentration has its own specific set of five courses that are required. And then you have 24 credits of electives. Uh, so that's usually about eight electives that you can take anywhere in the university uh, that's a 500 level or above. Um, some uh, programs throughout the university require signatures or special permission to get in, and then you work with us to, to get into those courses. In addition to that, um, in the spirit of Drexel, we want to make sure that you are workforce ready when you complete <coughs> our program. So we have an internship requirement and a portfolio requirement as part of the master's program. So the internship is typically a six month full time internship or the equivalent. And oftentimes you can focus one of your co-ops um, on more of your master's level interests and then have uh, you can apply to waive the internship requirement based on either your co-op or some other um, real-world experience. Um, and then the portfolio is a tool to help you showcase your skills and almost brand yourself as you're leaving the program and have either uh, electronically or hard copy work samples packaged with your resume, table of contents, and almost a brand of who you are and what you have to offer. Uh, we ask that you allow two turns to work on that while you're taking courses. You work with a faculty member in our department who advises and supervises that process. We have it uh, reviewed by an internal faculty member and an external professional um, person from the, your profession and help you revise it and polish it so it's, it's really top quality and ready to use as a showcase piece. So again, I'll be available afterwards to um, answer any questions you may have. 
Uh, but let's go ahead and uh, first I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, coming here today. Uh, they've come from far and wide to, uh, to join you and share their experiences and their careers. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to first uh, introduce each of them. They, they gave me a bio, um, so I'll, I'll tell you who they are. And then we have a few questions that we'd like them to, to address. Uh, and we will have <coughs> time for questions at the end. So if you just want to make note of any questions you have. Um, I'm going to start down at the end. Uh, Matt Bretzius is a communication professional who has worked as a journalist, technical writer, copy editor, and most recently a public relations and marketing professional both in-house and agency side. He has worked with startups to Inc. 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 500. Inc. 500. 5, 500 yeah. 5,000 companies. <laughs> spanning industries like consumer technology, enterprise technology, digital advertising marketing, green technology, pharmaceuticals, and consumer products. His PR clients have been featured in outlets including Entrepreneur, Fast Company, Wall Street Journal, Mashable, TechCrunch, Huffington Post, InStyle, Washington Post, Time, Forbes, Fox Business, and Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, Matt graduated with a bachelor's degree in journalism from West Virginia University in 2007 and earned his master's in communication from Drexel in 2012, which he completed through the university's online program. So you have the choice of online and face-to-face -face program at the master's level. He currently works and lives in New York City. Let's welcome Matt. Thank you for coming from New York. Um, next, we have Rebecca Goodman. Uh, she's the director of public relations for Comcast Spectacore, the Philadelphia-based sports and entertainment company, which owns the Philadelphia Flyers the home arena for both the Flyers and the NBA's Philadelphia 76ers, the Wells Fargo Center, and four Flyers Skate Zone community ice skating and hockey rinks. In this position, Rebecca is responsible for all day-to-day -day public relations activities at the Wells Fargo Center, including serving as publicist for all touring shows and events. Recently, Rebecca led public relations efforts for the 2014 NCAA Frozen Four Hockey Championship and the 2004 NHL Entry Draft, both held at the Wells Fargo Center. Rebecca has been in her current position since July 2013. Previously, she served as the publicist for the Philadelphia Flyers and public relations coordinator for the Philadelphia 76ers. She's a proud graduate, graduate of our comm program where she did both her bachelor's and her master's degrees in June 2011. So let's welcome. <laughs> um, next, we'll have Daniel Mann. He's a content specialist on the ads help and education team at Facebook. Daniel graduated with a bachelor's in English from the Ohio State University, then attended Drexel University to pursue a master's degree in technical communication and graduated in 2013. A few months prior to graduation, Daniel accepted his first full-time job offer as an associate technical writer at Workday. At Workday, Daniel quickly learned the ins and outs of being a technical writer in the Silicon Valley tech industry. After a year and a half of gaining experience, Daniel accepted his current role at Facebook where he develops and manages content in Facebook's Help Center specific to advertising. He attributes his career success to hard work, research, and perseverance. So let's welcome Daniel. <laughs> and uh, Julian Mills, our fourth panelist, has over 15 years' experience in various scientific roles uh, in the CRO, I'm sorry. Contract research organizations. Thank you. Contract research organizations, which she will tell you more about. Um, academic institutions and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, at PRA, she supports the late phase team where she is responsible for providing consulting services and developing post-marketing and late phase studies. Her role includes developing operational strategy, protocol design, and data collection tool development. She has experience with a wide variety of study designs such as disease and product registries, post-authorization safety studies, non-interventional studies, biomarker studies, and retrospective data integration. In her most recent work, Julianne has directly led or contributed to the successful on-time submission of over 12 post-marketing assessment, assessment reports, including REMs with elements to assure safe use and restriction distribution, which she will tell me more about. <laughs> she has experience in preparing responses to the FDA to address comments and questions regarding submitted assessment reports, and has presented before the Agency on Strategies for Standardizing Assessments. So welcome, to Julianne. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask um, each panelist to answer the first two questions in tandem and we'll go down the line and then I'll get to the third question. So um, the first thing, sorry, I'm supposed to cue you, turn that around. 
Um, <laughs> tell us about your career path and current job and how the MS Com program helped prepare you for your career. So tell us what you're doing and how being a, a graduate of our program helped prepare you to get there. And I'll, we'll just go ahead and start with Matt. We'll go down the line. Sure. Um, so as Sue mentioned, I started out as a journalism uh, graduate out of West Virginia and spent some time writing for uh, just various publications in the Philadelphia area and then wanted to make a change to get into public relations and marketing, uh, which is when I decided to enter here for the online graduate program in 2010. Um, since then, in leaving the journalism post, I've worked as a copy editor, I've worked as a technical writer, um, and now I'm at a marketing and PR firm in New York City. Um, <coughs> I can say that the degree in the way that it helped me get into this career path is, as a lot of people know, when you go to start looking for jobs, uh, everyone wants relevant experience, but it's hard to get experience if no one will give you experience. Uh, so I found that having this degree gave me some validation and some legitimacy to what I was trying to do to switch from journalism to public relations, because while people in the industry see them as having this big chasm between the two, um, really they're quite relatable and it's not that big of a leap to go from one to the other. Um, so that's, I think, the biggest positive that I was able to find is this, even though it's you know kind of a piece of paper, it really gave me um, the validation that I needed to, to enter my new industry and then find some success moving forward. <laughs> I spent my whole life in this program, I feel like. Um, I started as a freshman here at Drexel in 2003, um, and every course that I had in this program has, I think, put me where I am today at the Wells Fargo Center. Um, my One of my first courses was with Ron Bishop. I don't know if any of you have him or had him in the past, but I took sports journalism a couple months before I started as a sophomore as an intern at the Wells Fargo Center with the Sixers. Um, and I always, to this day, I tell um, Professor Bishop that that course really prepared me for the sports world. I mean, I had never written, you know, the way that a sports writer writes until I took that course. And then all of a sudden, I was put in the PR department at the Sixers, and they wanted me to update the website, and I actually knew how to do it. So. Um, I started, I feel like I was a baby back then, um, and I really spent most of my time at Drexel going between the Wells Fargo Center and classes. Um, and then I think midway through, I went to Mark Costello and I said, I think I want to do the master's program. And um, something that I really wanted to touch on when you had mentioned this is when I was in your shoes and when I was in college and, and undergrad, my mom would tell me about, you know, a master's degree and how hard it is to, you know, that it can be to take the GMATs to get into a program. And, and you know, you don't, when you're an undergrad, you're not always thinking about life after college and the, taking the GMATs and, and the cost that can be associated with, with graduate school. But I will tell you that as a graduate of, of, of the program and doing both, looking back on it, I'm so thankful that I that I did it while I was in college. Um, so that was my little soapbox. soapbox. But um, anyway, so as an undergrad, midway through, I went to Mark and, and decided to apply for the MS program. And the whole, the whole program from when I started, I did internships at the Wells Fargo Center. I did one internship at Comcast Corporation. And I would go back and forth between class and co-op and class and co-op. And I always tell people that I as a student, I started out my, my career at Drexel being in class more than I was at co-op. And then by the end, I was practically living and working at the Wells Fargo Center and coming back here for classes to finish, to finish up the master's program. But um, I, I feel so strongly about the program. Um, I really believe that having the master's degree in today's world is so important. Um, I'm, I'm in a world in the sports and entertainment industry where a lot of people have their master's degrees and, or I'm sorry, their bachelor's degrees and wish they went back for the master's degree, but because they didn't do it right after college immediately, 
Um, they just kind of never got the chance and, and always say to me, oh my gosh, you have your master's degree? And, and I almost, I don't want to say I forgot about it, but it, it was all just part of, of the same program. So I feel like it was really no different for me to just continue into the master's degree program, but I'm really glad that I did. Daniel? Sure. Um, just echoing what everyone said so far, I think the program definitely um, will lead you in the path that you want to go in, like regardless of which individual track you decide to take. Um, for instance, I took the technical communication track, um, and I knew coming in that I wanted to go and be a technical writer. Um, after I graduated from undergrad, I know I didn't have the skills, I didn't know how to write in that um, way. So I knew that um, a master's program would make sense to kind of build those skills up and um, prepare me for the workforce. Um, one thing in particular about the program that I um, really enjoyed was the internship because um, I just think having that um, hands-on experience um, is priceless. <laughs> Um, it's one thing to go through um, all of your courses and you could be a straight A student, but um, at the end of the day, employers are like, yeah, what have you done? And then you're like, well, I got an A in, pub <laughs> in PR. And they're like, okay, next. <laughs> so um, basically, I can't stress enough that um, real, wor real world experience is important and that's something you'll definitely get through the program and through the internship and that's something that I found to be particularly useful um, in getting where I am today. Julia? Um, so I'm a little bit different in that I have a dual degree from, from Drexel, so I have a, a degree in science communication and I um, work with the university to get a, a dual program degree in public health as well. Um, I started out in, in raw science. I was a bench scientist for a number of years and then decided that I didn't want to be a bench scientist anymore and didn't want to go back and get my PhD. So um, I just landed on a master's in communication because it was very broadly applicable and I thought I would be able to leverage that to m move on in my career without staying in the whole academic PhD track. Um, and I found this discipline called health communication. I'd never heard of it before. But at that time, um, I found that that's what I was doing in my job. I was um, writing materials that would be distributed to prescribers or to patients to help them understand the risks in prescribing medications or in taking their medications. And there's this whole concept of health literacy and health numeracy that I'd never heard of. And um, the more research I did about health communication, you know, it, it took me a while to figure out that that was the term. Um, and so I decided that that's what I wanted to get my master's in. And so I created my own program here at Drexel. Um, and I'm excited to hear that that's going to be something going forward. Um, the way the Masters in Communication specifically helped me was the portfolio. So everybody's talked about their internship. I opted out of the internship because of my work experience as a, an older student coming back. But that portfolio was essential for me um, to have something that showed I could do the work right, without having gotten a job in, in that area. Um, and so my advice would be, um, and Sue said they encourage you to start two terms early to develop that portfolio, really take it seriously because if you haven't worked in, in that field or, um, you know, I had uh, employers ask to see writing samples, um, it, it was really essential that I had that at the ready and prepared and formatted, et cetera. So that was a really a valuable piece coming out of the program. All right, thank you. So the, the next question has to do with preparing yourself for the workforce. So advice to undergraduate students. And um, I think it was Matt who brought this up. It would be helpful if each of you would share with us where you think you're headed, what you hope to do when you ultimately leave Drexel. What kind of a career are you looking for? So if you go ahead and start. Um, I'm trying to land a job somewhere in like a zoo or an aquarium kind of setting. I'm really into animals. I really want to um, get more in depth with like how they react with people and um, offices like along with that. So, okay. Yeah. No idea where I want to go. <laughs> no. All I know is I like technology and I like working with people. So I want to end up somewhere where I have a combination of those things um, and I want it to be something I'm passionate about. I had an internship at a nursing home. 
I now know I don't want to write about ugly people for the rest of my life. So there's something that I like with those two combinations that I'll be happy. All right. <coughs> well, I spoke with uh, Ms. Mills earlier. I'm, I'm an older student returning. Um, I have experience in, in writing technical writing, and that's the uh, master's track I want to take. And I wrote uh, technical writing in the Marine Corps, and that's some of the questions I have for you guys. Um, but um, I want to I want to do that uh, for, for a company or a training specialist since I already have a, a background in that. Mm -hmm. uh, my life right now looks like it's being directed by my parents back home in Asia. Um, I might be forced um, to do management between China and South Korea for steel trade. And um, I'm going to try to get out of there. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. So if it were your choice, what would you be doing um, without parental influence? I think it, I'd like to get um, somewhere between um, my dream job would be an intersection between uh, cheap technologies like the Google Chromebook and um, learning more about what constitutes online education as being effective and combining and synthesizing those two for public schools. Okay. They're underfunded. Oh, stay in Philly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we could use you. <laughs> um, I am, although I'm a senior, I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do, um, especially because I chose the business <coughs> administration program, and I'm not sure it's where I belong. Um, but uh, then I decided on marketing because the closest thing to communications and languages and things I've always been interested in. Um, but I'm here to know more. Maybe I'll figure it out today. <laughs> um, obviously, I don't really know like what I want to be in the future and where I'm gonna go like after I graduate. But like from what Rebecca said, because I'm like interested in sports too. Like I play sports in high school, so and now I'm a PR major, so I kind of want to like combine these together. Because I think it's better you work for something you're like interested in, not like just for money or like because that can like waste money. Um, I want to work in an entertainment company, so my first call I went to LA, so I might go back again, um, but now I'm working in casting company here, so I want to do post-production. Um, it's not really related to like communication, but it's somehow related, I don't know, I just feel like it. And then um, I'm taking minor in um, animation and visual effects and music theory and composition right now, so I want to combine those together and we're in the post production. Okay. So given that background, um, we're gonna start with Julianne and work our way back this time. What advice would you give to students, these students and any students who happen to watch the, the video feed later, um, as they finish up their degrees and prepare to enter the job market? What advice do you have? Um, it's been a long time for me. Um, so, uh, Drexel and, and any university, quite honestly, but Drexel in particular has a really um, viable network. And so, I would really encourage you to begin your network building now. You don't have to wait until you're a graduate with a degree um, to start reaching out to employers. It is so flattering to get an email from somebody who's trying to figure it out, doesn't have a clue, and wants to know more. I mean, it can be a really, you know, Hey, do you have 20 minutes to talk to me about the phone on the phone about what you do? Um, and I would encourage you to start start doing that now. Sometimes knowing what you don't want to do can be just as helpful. And if you haven't figured it out, it, I mean, don't worry about it. I've changed careers three times now. Like, there's always this pressure that you have to know. You just need to know what you're going to do this year. I'll say, it, it can always change. Would you agree? Yes, <laughs> I echo um, that. But um, yeah, I would definitely say that um, you should start networking now, you should start researching now, you should start, um, yeah, I think I would focus on networking and researching. Um, and when I say researching, I mean um, researching possibilities and finding out what it takes to reach those different possibilities. Um, that's kind of what I did. Um, I knew I wanted to go into technical writing, but there are several industries, for instance, that I could have gone in. And depending on what industry I decided to go into, I could have I 
could have possibly needed a completely different skill set, even though I'm t I would technically be a technical writer, but just in you know another industry. So those are the types of things that are important to know. Um, yeah, so I think research would definitely get you where you want to be. So I just want to take a, a brief pause to introduce uh, Dean Donna Marasco, who's arrived. I'm very glad she was able to join us. I'm being like a, a waitress catching you when you put the pizza in your mouth. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you. Did you want to say something now or no? Okay. Well, since you introduced me, I just want to thank you for coming. Um, I think it's so important for our students to see what can be done with our degrees and, and how you're enjoying your careers. And so taking your time out to come here, I really appreciate it. And I hope you all do too. So thank you. So Rebecca, go ahead. Um, I would say pick up the phone, shoot an email, ask for an informational interview. Um, I really encourage students to do that because an informational interview is a way to network without being so direct that you're networking. You know, you're kind of shooting an email or calling somebody to, see, to learn more about them. And people generally like talking about themselves. So you're pretty safe when, when you shoot somebody an email or, 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 t or you know, call somebody on the phone. Um, something else I've noticed as a Drexel grad is that Drexel grads are proud to be Drexel grads and usually really willing to help other Drexel grads. Um, so it can, it can really be, I mean, as a, a few of you were talking, most of you I was thinking, oh my gosh, I should put this, this person in touch with this person and this person in touch with this person. And I'm sure even among the four people sitting in front of you that, you know, we could help guide you to some of those informational interviews. Um, and the other, the other person I think that's big as I look at Mark is your counselor. Your, um, you know, right at Drexel, they keep in touch with a lot of um, students, and they would know who might would who mm -hmm. would be somebody in your field that you would want to talk to as well that you might not know. Um, so that would be that would be my suggestion. Uh, I think my biggest piece of advice um, when you start to look for a job is to be selective. I know. You'll, get, you'll graduate and you'll go home and you'll live with your parents and they'll pressure you to find something so that you can get out of their house and you'll feel <laughs> the pressure to find something because you want to start to make some money and you know pay your bills um, but I can't tell you in interviewing candidates for our firm how many times we get people who come in especially because marketing and PR and communications can be so broad uh, who they just see a job posting that has the word marketing or PR or communications in it and they say well that's what I do so I'm going to apply for that and that's what I want to do and then they get in and they hear the type of clients that we work with uh, in the industry that it's, that it's in and then they decide that that's not what they want to do because maybe they want to work in sports but the place that they went to works in science um, <clears throat> so I would just I would say be selective and don't feel the pressure to just go out and take the first job that comes your way because uh, <laughs> you would be a lot happier doing something that you're interested in and not just something that you're trying to get a paycheck for. I mean, I personally, since I graduated uh, almost 10 years ago, I think I've had like nine jobs. Um, just kind of bounce around different places. You know, I mean, it seems like a lot, but go somewhere for a year or two, you know, decide you want to do something else and that you like something better. And now, uh, all these years later, I feel like I kind of ended up in the place that I was meant to be. Um, so there's no harm in saying no to find what you're actually interested and passionate in. Thank you for the words of advice. Um, now I think what I'd like to do is open it up for questions and I'd like to start with uh, questions specifically for the panelists and then um, if any of you have questions about the program we can take some of those too. So yeah. The information interview, mm -hmm. um, I think it's really sad to say that it's the first time we've really heard that. Um, when you're asking for an informational interview, how do you approach it? Do you say to the person, because you kind of, I think the person on the other, on the receiving end will say, they're probably trying to sneak a job, their way into a job. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're genuinely looking for um, an informational interview, how do you approach it? What are your goals? And for the email, do you say, hey, I just want to know about your work? Mm -hmm. That's simply. So I'll put it in, in your 
context because I'll tell you who I was thinking about when you were talking. So you, as a college student, you have a lot of different ideas of different things that you're really passionate about that you would like to do. So, um, but you, you need guidance in kind of forming what that means for your life and what that could mean in terms of a job. So by asking for an informational interview, it could be done in so many different ways. It could be done, over, you could ask somebody, um, and it would be through a contact. Like, say I gave you this contact that I'm talking about. She oversees entrepreneurship at Comcast, but she's in charge of technology and works with the schools. I mean, it's like literally verbatim what you said. But so for, say, somebody like that, you, um, you know, you could reach out to her and say, I got your information from this person. It would, I'm looking for an informational interview. Could we meet for coffee? Would it be easier to do over the phone? I'm open to 15 minutes of your time, whatever it is that you can spare, and kind of let the other person tell you what works best for them. You know, some people can give you 15 minutes on the phone, that's fine. You know, some people would say, come on down to my office, let me show you around, let me show you what we do. Um, you know, I get, I get requests all the time for informational interviews, mostly from college students that are looking for direction. Um, you know, they might be in a calm uh, major or, or a different major, marketing major, whatever, um, that really just want to know what it's like in the real world to have that job, you know, and it kind of gives you a network to start with. Well, I'll just quick follow up then. Um, so you have 15 minutes. I think that would make any college student really nervous. You have someone who's older, senior to you, who's mm -hmm. more experienced. You want to get the most out of those 15 minutes. Um, what are the main things we should look for? Like if you've had your, any of you 15 minutes where you mm -hmm. interview somebody, and you say, oh gosh, I wish I asked the certain question and I never got that answer. What, what are the key points you'd advise any college student to look for outside of um, the information of what the field's like? W would you look at them? Um, I would say, honestly, I, I think the most important question that a college student asks me is, what is your day-to-day -day like? Because that kind of really can you know give you a very good understanding of what this person's job is you know in my job my job's different really every day depending <coughs> on the day I mean I could be out at a community event I could be you know we could have a huge event happening at the Wells Fargo Center I mean it could be so different every day but that sort of question from a college student opens the door for me to talk about all the different things I could do in my job even though you're specifically asking about a day you know in my day would be totally different from your day so that gives you know, a student or who, who you know, whoever is asking, um, a good understanding of what that person's job is. Do any of the other panelists want to add to the response to the question of? I'd like to riff on that for a second. So, the informational interview is a term of art. So, most people are going to know what that is. Um, it's likely that the person you're speaking to is going to monopolize the conversation for most of it. Um, in my experience, really good questions are: What advice do you have for me? If you weren't doing this, what else would you be doing? And is there somebody else I should be talking to? There you go. There's 15 minutes. So, and you asked about um, feel, maybe feeling a little bit awkward that it's an informational interview and you're looking yeah. for a job. So what? Ask for a job. You may, the, the goal of the informational <laughs> interview is to, to learn more. And you might find out at the end of it, this isn't really the person I need to be talking to. So, hey, is there somebody else I can talk to? Or you may find, this is really interesting. I want to know more. Is your company currently hiring? I still do informational interviews. It's not something that you just do uh, you know, as an undergrad trying to get out of your job. Anytime you want to switch careers, you'll, you'll find yourself doing this to rebuild your network. <coughs> Everybody knows you're looking for a job. It's not anything to be ashamed of. Daniel or Matt, either of you want to comment on that? Yeah, and just to go off of um, that, um, I've even had someone request an informational interview from me that is probably 30 years my senior. <laughs> and you know, I was kind of like, you know, Wow, like, what can I really tell you? But they were in the education um, field and they were just looking for a change. And just like, you know, a college student, they didn't have any experience in the field. So you can't really just like see yourself as, oh, I'm just this college student who, you know, is starting from scratch and I don't have any experience. Like there are a lot of people who are also switching careers that may be older than you, but they are in, in the same um, boat as you. So. You can't really um, put yourself, um, you know, see yourself in that way. 
I think it's also important to understand that anyone who is going to agree to meet with you for those 15 minutes understands the boat that you're in. They're not going to meet with you for 15 minutes just to completely shut you down and like laugh at you for not having a job. You know, <laughs> if they're going to give you 15 minutes of their time, the thought is that they're going to give you some valuable information and they're going to try and impart some wisdom. So I wouldn't go in there with the fear of, you know, I, I only have 15 minutes. What can I get out of this? I mean, like everyone else kind of said, just take full advantage of it and, you know, be confident with it and see what happens. And the other thing I, I would say is don't feel this overwhelming pressure to, like, follow up the next day and be completely prepared. I mean, you want to do some research, like, like Daniel said. Like, don't come in and be like, what does PRA do? Like, okay, okay. then, you, you know, you haven't really thought at all about why, why we're meeting. But... Um, I always felt as an undergrad that like I had to follow up the next day. I had to be completely thorough and on top of everything. That's totally unrealistic. <laughs> it's totally unrealistic. I was just helping out my neighbor's son trying to find a, a marketing. I'm gonna totally hit you up. Okay. Um, a marketing <laughs> internship, and um, he just was like overwhelmed that he hadn't sent me his resume the day after we had talked. And I was like, a resume takes months to build. Like, let's let this be an iterative process. So, you know, give yourself some slack. And just one last thing on that, too, is it doesn't, like she kind of said, it doesn't always have to be immediate. Like, you don't have to meet with someone and then make a call and follow up. You, it, it's a, a process that takes some time. I remember when I was coming out of college um, looking for a journalist job and trying to figure out how to best break into the industry, um, I was introduced to one of the sports editors at the Inquirer, and we kind of had like a six-month-long dialogue just back and forth where, you know, we would talk every couple of weeks, and, and I would just check in and see if they were hiring, what was going on. Um, and eventually he did offer me a job. I accepted a job somewhere else, but you know, it does work out. So just even if it's you develop some sort of relationship, you can just check in with someone every couple of months while you're still looking and see how things are going. You know, it's, you'll find that everything you do is like really relationship driven and you just never know who you know and who you meet who could help you out later on down the road. There was one more thing I wanted to just chime in as far as networking goes. I would encourage everyone to create a LinkedIn if you don't have one. Um, and just kind of make sure that you have your experience on there. You know, um, start connecting with people who are in your field who, you know, you see they have some of the skills that you may not necessarily have, but they seem like they could be someone that you could talk to to point you in the direction where you could start learning those skills. It's just, I mean, yeah, it's definitely something I would um, encourage everyone to do. Um, Are you allowed I found that particularly. You're allowed to promote other social networks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, since you mentioned about LinkedIn, um, so I got one message. I don't know if he's trustable or not, but one guy was like, said that he's hiring. And then he just sent like a private message to me, like, oh, like, if you're interested in, like, work like a full-time or part-time just contact him and then I searched like um his company is in Center City mm -hmm. and they talk about social media and stuff and he mentioned that because I have experience which I don't really have it just because I'm like still in the second call and mm -hmm. then he said if I want to interview just come down so like is it trustable? <laughs> um, there's so here's one thing I'll say about <laughs> looking for jobs in marketing and PR yeah. is you will find um job listings that say like marketing, sports PR, sports entertainment PR, and you'll go and they'll bring you in, it'll be a bunch of young people, they'll be playing loud music, it'll sound awesome, they'll tell you how much money you can make, they'll bring you back for an interview, and you'll get there and it's door to door sales. And what it is is you're handing out flyers to businesses trying to get them to buy coupons for stuff. So to answer your question, I'm not saying that that's what that is, but you should definitely take the time to vet like any opportunity, especially when someone approaches you without you going out to them first because, I mean, unfortunately, you just never know what you're walking into. I got suckered into one of those myself, um, spent eight hours one day like walking around the neighborhood trying to sell massages door to door. Um, you know, it's horrible. So, Knowing what you don't <coughs> want to do, right? That's, yeah, that's, right. What, that's what you don't want to do. I was not giving the massages. It was somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, is that, you know, you just, yeah, people will reach out to you once they see that you're an upcoming graduate um, on LinkedIn and on these different networks, and they'll try and recruit you. But definitely do your due diligence and 
and do some research. And then on the other side of that, there are some times where you will be um, contacted by someone where it is legit. So, mm -hmm. you know, don't just automatically assume that, oh, you know, I don't know who this is and why would they reach out to me? I didn't send them my resume. Like, why would they, you know, don't assume that it's um, always going to be sketchy because I've actually been contacted maybe 12 times in the last year by legitimate companies who wanted to interview me. Um, I turned a lot of them down, but just the f like after like doing my research, I realized that they were legitimate, and I even went out for an on-site interview for one. So you never know. I think that's part of um, like what I'm saying though about it being a valuable resource um, potentially, um, and also you, you're gonna see you know those random door-to-door -door massage <laughs> type of gigs you know come through as well but you know just kind of having discernment as well I get a job offer about once a week from Drexel Spam like $500 from home I don't know if you guys get those as well. yeah, yeah, yeah. the other thing I was gonna say about um, LinkedIn is uh, so I'm I'm older now and have um, some working experience but I find that recruiters must do like a keyword search because mm -hmm. every now and again I'll get a, a LinkedIn mail from just some generic you know pharmaceutical recruiting company saying we have jobs available. They're they're legit, mm -hmm. um, but they're you know it's not tailored. It's it's blasted. Um, but I've been able to use LinkedIn quite effectively for for job interviews. Um, to go back to a point that Matt had made earlier, I was laid off a couple of years ago and worked with an outplacement agency that sort of helped you reframe your career and how do you sell yourself and all this kind of stuff. And one of the things they had said is, okay, blank slate, right? Make a list of characteristics of the job you want or the environment that you like to work in or the, the subject material that you want to work in. You know, make a list of these things. Because there's going to come a time in your job hunt where you're going to get desperate and you're going to just want any job. And so that was a really good tool for me to go back to and say, okay, do any of these things appear in this job description? And if they did, then I would go through the labor to apply for it. But if not, stop being desperate and move on to something else. It was a good way for me to not get too hungry. So I recommend that as well. Any other comments about the question? Um, as uh, I was saying, networking, how would I find someone with technical writing background? Um, because that, uh, that's a career I want to uh, want to do, but I'm an expert in weaponry and tactics and explosives, and I don't think that's really in the Philadelphia area. Um, <laughs> but I do enjoy I do enjoy teaching in in, in any fashion um, and learning about a new new subject would would it, uh, intrigue me enough to then write about it as well. How would, I, how would I meet people in order to network with them? Uh, it doesn't matter if it was in like Philadelphia area or by by email, because I'm up for moving. I, you know, mm -hmm. even though I'm from Philadelphia, but I would move for uh, for jobs. But to to network, how would I find someone in that field? Sure. Um, there's actually a professional organization called STC, which stands for Society for Technical Communication. And that's literally like, I mean, everyone pretty much there has technical writing or some sort of um, similar experience. And they're in a variety of different industries. And you could basically just, you know, meet different people, take your pick. I mean, there's there would be a lot of people like this, except everyone would be like specific. Um, they would have experience specific to technical communication. But um, yeah, you would be able to. That would be a good starting point, I think. Um, there's a Philadelphia um, chapter also. Um, so there's like a national chapter, and then there's different geographical chapters. Um, I would start with joining the um, Philadelphia Metro chapter and just start um, finding out when they meet and attending those um, meetings and starting to talk to people there. I think Dr. Souter can help connect you to that local group as well because he's made some connections. I'd have to think that there's also, again, with LinkedIn, that there's, mm -hmm. they probably have a LinkedIn group. You can do some searching on there. Mm -hmm. They actually um, belong to LinkedIn any already. I okay. already had a career and, and all that, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm changing my, my life, so. 
<laughs> Did you have another question? Yeah. Um, I guess the two older people on the end have had. <laughs> Wait, who? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Just, just plow forward. Go ahead. <laughs> you guys um, have chosen. <sighs> A lot of jobs, and you just said you had 15 years of experience, and you you stated that you've changed your um, career three times, and um, you've had nine different jobs, I believe, in the last 10 years. I'm only 30, by the way. Just <laughs> <laughs> two wiser people. All right. and, and, and the, the two nice middle, piece of communication. <laughs> and the two of you have, um, I believe, this is your like your first career path right now. Um, for the, for the both of you, do you see yourself branching out and when do you create that indicator that you say to yourself, hey, it's really time? Because I think complacency at a job, you, you get your first job after college, you look at your peers and you say, wow, the job market's really tough, um, but you're doing well and at what point do you say to yourself, I need to take the risk and go for something else? Or when do you say, you know what, maybe I should just stay here? Uh, what what key elements kept you in the same job or made you change jobs? I, I think growth. I mean, I literally for the first time in 10 years, <coughs> I'm now at the point where I'm like, okay, what else is out there? Um, but until this point, you know, I started with the MBA and then I went from the MBA, I was promoted to a publicist position with the NHL, with the Flyers, and then now... Um, that I'm doing PR for the entire building. So I was able to grow in those 10 years, but now I'm at the point where, and a lot of my friends, by the way, I'll be 30 next month. So a lot of my friends are at this point now where we, we've all been out of school really for five to seven years, depending on if, you know, who did master's programs and that kind of stuff. And everybody that I talk to is starting to feel that itch, like what's next? You know, what? A lot of people are thinking, you know, I was in the same career for a long time. I might want to do something a little bit different. Um, I think growth. I think you always want to be looking at your next position, um, you know, where, where you might go in your own career. You don't want to become stagnant. You don't want to, you know, keep the same exact job for, you know, too many years. That you should always be looking to climb the ladder a little bit. So I think growth in a company is huge. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely, um, especially in – the marketing and PR industry agency side for sure. Uh, it's kind of a written rule that it's you can't go in advance unless you leave where you are to go somewhere else. Um, it's just easier, not that you can't, but like it's easier to get a new title and a bit more money to just stay where you are for two years and then maybe go to a different agency. Um, it's not always the case, but to, to keep your eye on um, the way that the company's building around you and what your career path can be within that company because if you get to a certain point where you see that um, you know maybe they're not promoting people past a certain level within your path or maybe they're filling up a lot on lower management but they're not really bringing in senior management you know you can kind of get stuck and, and silo down to the bottom um, you know that happened to me at, at one spot and I had to move on to go somewhere else to get a better position um, the other thing is sometimes when you know it's time to go, it's just it's when the little stuff like just really starts to bother you at work and you know you just can't you just you're just you're just ready to move on. It's like anything else. There comes a time where you just realize like you've learned a lot where you are, but you're ready to take your skills and challenge yourself more doing something else somewhere else. Also, um, coming from the Silicon Valley, there's like a big culture about kind of moving on to the next thing. So everyone is literally doing that. And if you're not, it's kind of like, what are you doing? So um, yeah, I would definitely encourage you to always be thinking about what that next step is gonna be. Um, even, in, you know, I've graduated two years ago from Drexel um, and this is already my second job. So um, that kind of goes to show that, you know, there's no time frame, like you don't have to like commit to like, oh, I'm going to do this, you know, X number of years and then I'm going to move on. Like you should kind of feel it out and kind of know, I think you'll know when it's time to move on. That's one thing um, 
though that's the question that I asked um, a lot of other people like when do you know when it's time to move on and a lot of people have told me like you'll kind of know and I'm like what do you mean by that but then when that time came for me I did know mm -hmm. and um, I started to look elsewhere I found another job um, and also um, I noticed at the job that I um, started at that they weren't necessarily promoting people at the rate that I thought was um, made sense in most companies. Um, I noticed that they would hire senior level people in, but I didn't see many people who were mid-level, for instance, rise to senior level in my time there. And some people had been there like since the company started and they're still mid-level, but they hired someone else. Um, you know, I just saw a lot of weird kind of things happening and I'm like, well, what does that mean for me in my career, right? Um, so just kind of noticing um, how things are going and like the environment that you've entered into is really important in uh, making that so It's really decision. growth in company culture and you have to assess where you stand there and then you just kind of, okay. I think too there's an, uh, an unfair negative stigma um, for people who do move around mm -hmm. to different jobs, like saying, like a lot of people ask, they say, like, well, don't you think when you go to your next <coughs> job yeah. that that's going to look bad, you know, on your resume that you've been at all these different places? Um, I don't think that's the case. I like to think that if Rebecca and I were up for the same job, you know, we're the same age, we're basically the same experience level, that they're not going to look at her and say she's been at one place for nine years and he's had, you know, this many jobs in ten years, so we have to hire her instead. At the end of the day, you're going to be judged based on you, not you know where you were and, and how long you were there necessarily. I would, I would just, in my field anyway, um, we recently had a candidate that came in and she had changed jobs every two years, and that was a flag. It's okay to change jobs frequently as long as you also have a place where you've landed for a little bit. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, in my industry, that doesn't make sense to be changing every two years. The longevity is usually around four years. Is industry dependent? Yes, well? I would say definitely. Can be. That's why it's important to do the research, mm -hmm. <laughs> to know that, you know. And I think it can be a positive, too. I mean, you know, I, I work with people. Um, our company is part of Com uh, Comcast Corporation, which is how I know the woman I was telling you about. And it really interests me to learn how their company works compared to my company. I, I only know the culture of my company. But, you know, for example, Matt knows company culture and you know, nine or ten other places, which I think can be really beneficial, too. Mm -hmm. So do you acknowledge that, that during an interview that you're the kind of person who likes to move from one place to the other? Or do you? Um, I mean, I don't think I've ever told anyone that I like to move from one place <laughs> to the other. I think really just <laughs> if someone asks about it, I mean, I've always just been honest and I've said that, you know, like I want when I work somewhere, I want to make sure that the entire time that I'm there, I'm passionate about what I'm doing and that like every day when I come to work, I'm committed to what I'm doing at work. Um, because if it gets to the point where I'm not, I'm not doing the company any good. You know, so like it's, what, it's, what, it's, what it's, Matt just did yeah. is tell you a story about his career. And that's what you need to do, is what's the story? So what's your story for asking for this informational interview? What's your story for having moved around a lot? What's your story for having stayed? You just need to, you know, know how you're going to message that. That's communication. It's interesting because, like I said, mentioned before, um, I'm pretty indecisive of where I want to go, and also I feel like I, I chose a field I'm not very sure about, and I'm very scared to be, in a sense, too honest about it because how does that look? I think it's something that's be fine to share in an informational interview. I think for an interviewer, you're right. That would you want to frame that a little, little bit differently. I think there's a sign up about framing, right? <laughs> frame it a little bit differently. Admittedly, I've been fortunate that the industries that I have switched around from they do all sort of complement each other. Um, so, like from going from journalism to PR, it's just opposite sides of the coin. So I've been able to frame that myself, as in like I've seen both sides of the industry. So I, you can position it as a strength, not that. I changed my mind at one point, you know, and went from one thing to the other. So, like as she said, you know, you, you can turn it into a story of why you did it um, and how it's made you a better candidate, you know, for that job right then and there, rather than, you know, having it being focused on as a negative. Any other questions for our panelists? 
So I'm going to ask an unplanned question, which is any final comments, words of advice as we send these students back out onto Drexel's campus? Any final? This is such a great program. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> say enough for the program. I have the experience of having friends at Drexel that did not choose to do this program. They're still doing great. But a lot of them have said, a lot of them didn't realize you could do the program while you were here and wish they had done it. I have friends from other universities that are in jobs that have gone through, you know, the GRE, is that what's called? The GRE, mm -hmm. GRE testing and, and, you know, the costs associated with it post you know, graduate or, you know, after you get your, your bachelor's degree, and it, it is such a good program. I mean, you you get the work experience that you need when you leave here at an undergrad price, and you, and it's all embedded into the same program. And, and a lot, I remember when I was thinking about doing the program versus not doing the program, I, I kept thinking, you know, it's another whole year, you know, is that okay? you know, in my life, and, and it is, I'm telling you, it is well worth the year, very well worth, worth the year. It took me a little bit longer, but <laughs> we could talk about that offline. <laughs> um, I would add, um, when I, years ago when I was getting my bachelor's, the question was put to me, would I go on and get my master's? And I thought, well, I'll work for a couple of years and then figure it out. And by the time I was three, five years into working, I figured, well, um, a bachelor's with seven years from the job descriptions I was looking at, a bachelor's with five to seven years or master's. So those were equivalent. And so once I had five to seven years of working experience, I was like, well, it'd be a waste of money for me to go get my master's, right? Fast forward 10 years where I really wish that I had gotten it. So if this is a, a good opportunity for you to just plow through and get it, I second what Rebecca's saying. Get the master's. It makes you more competitive. You may get some pushback from employers that you're overqualified. Um, I was told that with my bachelor's, believe it or not, um, your internship may also make you overqualified for some jobs. Just push through it. It'll pay off in the long end. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, um, particularly for those of you who maybe aren't sure yet completely with what you want to do, um, I think it's a, it's a great option just because you're going to spend that extra year where, you know, if you don't do it and you graduate, maybe you're switching a job you know in your first year trying to figure out what you're going to do but when when you're here in this program um, you'll get to to figure out and really learn what it is that you're interested in and then when you leave you'll not only have the master's degree you'll have an internship and you'll have a professional portfolio which essentially is like one year of employment experience and you're going to be able to go out and be a better candidate for the industry that you've now discovered that you want to be in. So it's almost like having your one year job experience, you know, obviously you're still going to school, but you're going to have all the tools when you leave to really get to be where you want to be rather than kind of just, you know, wondering and, and having to do a, a try and see what happens approach. Daniel, any closing final words? Um, I, all I would say to that is that um, if you're like one who's maybe on the fence and you're like, oh, I don't know if I really want to do an extra year, five years, I mean, yeah, a lot of people at other universities go, you know, five years in school without having graduated with their master's, a portfolio, or any internship experience. I'm sure you guys will know people who, um, are like your friends who will graduate in five years and you'll be at a completely different place than they are. Mm -hmm. So I'd like us to first of all thank the alumni. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thanks to Alumni Relations Institutional Advancement, we have a little thank you for you. Um, and uh, we have some time remaining for informal networking questions. I'm here to answer questions uh, about the program. David can answer questions about the program. Mark can answer questions about the program. Um, good networking opportunity for you uh, for, for contacts, for job search and everything. So thank you, thank you again, everybody.